All right, welcome everyone to our very last lecture of new material for this quarter. You've almost made it. Another week and a half of hard work and you'll be done. Um, so we will be going over some, um, our last, it's not even really new contact because we kind of end our concept because we ended last week with it. Um, and it was on some of the um, homework problems that you may have started working on with gas laws. Um, but we're going to spend today's lecture mostly um, talking about the ideal gas law and practicing with it. And remember that the ideal gas law was that combined form of the gas laws where we can put all four of the relevant variables to describe any gas into the same equation. Um, and so it's not, I always like to, to preface this with, it's, it's not the ideal gas law because the equation is ideal. Um, it's, which is kind of the way I always interpreted it when I was in high school and, and college, it seemed like, well, the ideal gas law, it's called that because it's, it's ideal, it has everything in it. Um, but it's not actually that the equation is ideal, it's that we're assuming that the gas itself is ideal. Um, and what that basically means is that we're treating these, this um, ideal gas as though it doesn't go through any phase changes ever, and that the gas molecules don't take up any space. So realistically, gas molecules themselves take up space. Most of the space in a gas is empty space where there's no gas molecules there. But the gas molecules themselves do take up some small fraction of the, of the overall container. Um, but in an ideal gas law, we're basically making the assumption that that's not the case, that the amount of volume that the gas molecules take up is so small that we don't need to worry about it. We can ignore it and get the right answer within sig figs. And under normal circumstances, that's pretty accurate. Um, so we'll continue on with that and we'll talk about where that breaks down and, and how to, um, we won't get into how to account for that in this class, at least not math, math, mathematically, but conceptually we'll talk about what, what happens with that um, in just a few minutes. Um, so basically all we're working on today is we're going to, I'm going to answer some quiz questions, especially the ones that are relevant to the material. Um, and then we'll do practice with gas laws. We'll work with the ideal gas law. And then the, the probably the most useful thing at this point about the ideal gas law for this class is that it allows us to go from a gas where we know things like pressure and volume and temperature into moles, which means we can do stoichiometry with it. So this is just going to give us one more way that we can calculate the number of moles that we have. Once we know how many moles we have, it doesn't matter that it started as a gas. We can still calculate all the same, same things. We can still do theoretical yield or excess reagent, um, et cetera. So uh, it's, a, it's just one more tool in our toolbox when it comes to predicting how much product we can make. Is the, is the best way to think about it at this point. All right, so a couple of random questions. And the fact that I got so many random questions last week tells me that uh, either you guys have some really good random questions you really want answered before the quarter's over, or more likely um, that we're going at, at the uh, right pace because not too many of you are um, are necessarily feeling lost about gas laws and where we are with some of these calculations. So that's a good sign as we're coming into the end of the quarter, uh, at least for the class as a whole. And if you are still feeling a little bit lost on some stuff, um, you're still not alone. We just It just tells me I've got a good mixture of people that are feeling comfortable and people that, um, that still want a lot of uh, more help on some of these concepts we're adding. So we'll still be doing that. Um, Somebody asked a question about vitamins and how come, why is it that some vitamins are soluble and some aren't? Um, and this is a good question because it gets into solubility in general, which is something we've talked about. Um, 
and generally what, what this question is asking is if it's a soluble vitamin, um, that means we're, we're referring to water soluble. More accurately, we usually divide up vitamins into water soluble vitamins and fat soluble vitamins. Um, fat soluble vitamins means that they dissolve better in non-polar sol um, solvents. So they dissolve well into things like cell membranes. So they dissolve well into butter or into any, any real fatty material um, is going to dissolve some of these, these vitamins better. Um, and a, a vitamin in general is just a carbon-based molecule that your body needs, but it can't make on its own. So we have to get these through our diet and we don't need that much of them necessarily, but then getting them from our diet and our digestive system into our body is the trick. And water soluble vitamins, that happens really easily because they dissolve in water. You're, when your body brings water from your stomach or your intestines into your body, uh, it brings the vitamins with it. If it's not a water soluble vitamin, vitamin though, generally you have to um, take those vitamins, the fat soluble vitamins, especially with um, food. You have to eat food with them because that kind of primes your body to be digesting things. And then as your body's bringing fat from your food in, into your body, um, it brings the vitamins with it that way and allows those vitamins to cross the, the uh, barriers of your, your intestines and become, um, become part of your body that way. Um, minerals, on the other hand, which get lumped in with vitamins, minerals are non-carbon based nutrients that you need a little bit of in order to, to survive. Um, and a lot of minerals don't dissolve well in fats or in water. And so minerals are kind of hard to get absorbed properly. Um, and so and eating does help, generally speaking, because your body is is sort of in absorption mode, but you're still um, somewhat limited. Getting minerals from supplements is effective, but usually you need way more than the actual amount of, of minerals that you want to absorb. You want to absorb 100% of your recommended daily intake um, of a mineral. You're, you're going to need to take a supplement that has 500% of your RDA. Um, and so that's because a lot of the minerals are not well absorbed in supplement form. Um, and that's, that is a whole topic. Every single mineral has its own problems and own best way of, of administering it. It's a, it's, it's why dietetics and nutrition in general is an entire field of study, right? Because things like absorption, just, you know, you can get an entire PhD on the absorption of iron through the, was it the epithelium of this large, of the small intestines in the presence of spinach or something like that. Um, so it's an exceptionally complicated field because the body's complicated, it turns out. Um, but it is also very interesting. Um, uh, in general, if you're it, the best approach though, if you, to get the best absorption of any vitamins or minerals that you're taking as a supplement, do it with food, with a complete meal, ideally, not just like with a Ritz cracker and some water. Um, but it can be done. You don't you can get enough absorption to survive just by um, vitamins and mineral supplements. Um, this one, this next one, I had to answer because it bothers me so much. Um, and it's not actually movies and TV. Movies and TV, I recognize, okay, I'm watching a TV show. I'm gonna suspend my science thinking for the most part um, and recognize they're going to take certain liberties for the sake of, of making better entertainment. I'm okay with that. Um, sometimes it bothers me, but generally I'm fine with it. What really bothers me is advertising. Marketing and commercials that use unscientific thinking and are selling crap pseudoscience products for that are they're charging three times with their worth because they're using the right buzzwords um, really, really bothers me, especially when they make random claims like um, all of the ingredients in this children's medicine is naturally sourced. What does that even mean? I mean, I, I get that they're saying it's coming from natural products, but 
that doesn't inherently make it any better than something made in a lab. Some things made in a lab, the same compound made in the lab frequently is actually better for you because it's going to have fewer side products. It's going to have fewer other random things in there than something that you get from a natural source. Um, so, and besides, so that's, it's really not the science of it. It's that they're falling into what they call the naturalistic fallacy. Just because something is natural doesn't make it good. And just because something's from a lab doesn't make it bad. Those are two separate distinctions. You know what's natural? Anthrax is natural. Botulism is natural. Arsenic's natural. Aspirin is not. Aspirin is synthetic. It's from a lab. Aspirin does not occur naturally. So if you take aspirin or ibuprofen or acetaminophen, all of that always has to come from a lab. And that's incredibly useful medication. So that's, that is my pet peeve when it comes to things is mostly on the advertising side. When you see something that says chemical free or sourced from natural ingredients, it just makes me want to burn something down. Um, but I resist. Anyway, um, I really liked this next question. If for no other reason, then it's kind of a cool way to talk uh, to uh, bring up neurology um, and consciousness in general. Um, is un undeniably the most common science that we use in everyday life is physics, because when you think about the num the actual calculations that your brain is going through unconsciously just to do something as simple as throw a ball and hit a target. You're taking into account wind resistance, you're taking into account the density of the ball, you're taking into account how far away it is and the, the shape of the parabola. You doesn't feel like it. You're not doing it consciously necessarily, but your body is doing that on its own. Your brain is thinking about that and taking into account all of your previous experience that has to do with this is how I throw a ball. Um, and so it's, it's really, really cool when you think about all of that's happening under the hood of your consciousness um, without you needing to think about it. And you're not putting numbers to it. You don't put numbers to it till you get to a physics classroom, but you're absolutely using your intuitive knowledge of physics and how the world works. And if you, if we, you tried to go to the moon and throw a baseball, your brain would be totally lost because gravity and air resistance don't you know, exist in a totally different way on the moon. There is no air resistance on the moon. And the gravity is so, so slight that if you could conceivably on a small enough moon, um, you could put a, a, an MLB pitcher on, on moon and if they threw it a baseball hard enough, they could put it into orbit five feet off the ground because gravity and air resistance work so differently there. Um, and so it's, I really think that that was a cool question because there's a ton of things that you do. Walking requires you to understand physics and in, in, intuitively. That's why it takes a, you know, a whole year of your life to learn how to do it um, because you have to understand how gravity works. You have to understand how center of mass works. Um, even if you don't realize that's what you're understanding. So definitely physics for that one. That's also why physics was understood or started being studied as a science way before biology and chemistry because you use it everywhere and you see it everywhere. Um, can something be cold but be boiling? Uh, absolutely. When things are going through a phase change, they stay at that temperature, right? So anything that has a boiling point that we would that is um, we would associate with being cold is going to be both boiling and cold to the touch. So liquid nitrogen is a prime example. It boils at 78 Kelvin, which is negative 200 Celsius about. Um, it's boiling, but it's very cold. And even you can also get water to boil at low temperatures. If you lower the atmospheric pressure enough, water will boil. Um, and you can get water to boil at basically any temperature you want by controlling the atmospheric pressure. Things boil when their vapor pressure, which is basically how much of that, that uh, substance can exist in the gas phase at the same time as the liquid phase, when their vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure, things boil. 
So if you lower atmospheric pressure, things boil at lower temperatures. You lower the um, atmospheric pressure enough, you can get water to boil at say 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and that point it's gonna feel pretty cold. In fact, you can actually take water and make it boil by just putting your hand on the glass if it's under a vacuum, if the vacuum is strong enough. So you can absolutely have something that is both cold and boiling. We only think of boiling as being hot because we're used to water boiling. That's the most common thing we see boiling. But anything that can boil uh, at low temperatures if you adjust the atmospheric pressure as well. When diving in water, do parts of your body decrease in volume with added pressure? It's a gas laws question. Great question. Uh, and the answer is yes, unless you're breathing from an air supply. If you're in a scuba system, that's not going to be the case. If you're under, in a scuba system, you're basically increasing the pressure in your lungs to match the pressure outside your body. Um, and if you're doing that, then your lungs are going to stay at about the same size, regardless of how deep you go. Um, so, and, and the only thing, the only parts of your body that would really decrease with volume are, are the gases, because remember, um, that liquids and solids don't generally um, get compressed. They're generally considered incompressible. So as you increase pressure by adding, by going down under the surface of the water, you're going to see that only the, the parts of your body that have a lot of gas, a trapped gas in them are gonna be affected. So your ears, your sinuses, um, which is why it can mess with your equilibrium as well. Um, your lungs, to some extent, your digestive system, although that's less noticeable because your digestive system is already very flexible in terms of how big it is. Um, but yeah, you, you absolutely will see, will see that happen, um, but not if you're breathing as you're changing pressure. If you're breathing while you're changing pressure, your body adapts to it to a pretty large extent. You can get up to um, something like five atmospheres of pressure without too much trouble if you go slow and you're breathing the whole way because that allows your entire body to adjust at the same time. Um, and free diving, they will absolutely see that though. If you're doing it without an air supply, you will absolutely see your lungs compressed to a certain extent, um, which is why you have to be careful doing that. Um, and free diving in general, without a lot of practice and knowledge of what you're doing, you can really hurt yourself, um, your ears and your lungs. And in theory, if you went deep enough, you could collapse your lungs um, and give yourself the bends, even though in theory, if you're not using a scuba tank, you shouldn't be able to give yourself the bends. But if you go to enough pressure, you can, because it'll basically force the air that's in your lungs to dissolve into your bloodstream. Um, and then when you come back up, those that extra gas that's in your bloodstream will bubble out and create em, they call it an embolism, which is when you have a bubble in your circulatory system, which is a really, really painful, bad thing, um, which is why people die going scuba diving. It's not going down generally, it's coming back up too fast. Um, and last but not least for, for the random questions, muriatic acid versus acidic drain cleaner. They're both strong acids. Muriatic acid is hydrochloric acid. Drain cleaner, acidic drain cleaner is generally sulfuric acid. Um, the, since they're both strong acids, what would be the factor that causes more damage? Well, there are two aspects of it, really, is if they're both strong acids, they're both going to dissociate 100% when you put them in water, right? They're both going to give away their proton 100% of the time. Um, but if you have more moles of one of them, if one of those acids is more concentrated, then it can cause more damage because it has more H pluses it can give away. Um, the other aspect is that sulfuric acid and nitric acid, when they give away their proton, they will actually both turn into a toxic chemical. When you take, if you have too much nitrate dissolved in water, uh, it winds up turning into nitrogen dioxide, which is toxic, um, and nitrogen monoxide as well. And sulfuric acid, 
if you have too much sulfate dissolved, it will turn into um, sulfur trioxide and sulfur dioxide, which are both poisonous and can cause lots of health problems as well. So there are other reactions that can happen other than just the acids. Um, so just considering them strong acids, we would just look at how what the concentration is. But beyond that, you've got to deal with the fact that you make other poisonous toxic byproducts along the way, um, which can cause their own, their own side effects and, and problems that way. Um, and muriatic acid, if you've never heard of it before, you, you, um, it's used to adjust the pH in pools. So, um, and uh, it's also used for cleaning concrete. If ever um, cleaned concrete before, I think so. You know, it's sold at, at a lot of hardware stores. Actually, both of these are sold at hardware stores, and they're very, very dangerous. Um, but they still sell them over the counter because, for the most part, if if you're following the directions and wearing gloves and eye protection, you shouldn't be able to hurt yourself too badly. Um, but they don't have you use sulfuric acid to clean your driveway or to put it in a pool because they don't want to generate that sulfur trioxide um, because it's so bad for you. All right, and I'm get, also getting lots of questions about what the heck do we do next if you're progressing, if you're taking, uh, need to take more chemistry for your major, or if you just want to take more chemistry, what should you take next? Um, so if you're, if you're going into some form of nursing or healthcare that's not pre-med or pre-dental, um, so x-ray tech, uh, nursing, um, then you're going to be looking you probably are done with the chemistry you're required to take after this class. Um, that said, if you want to take more chemistry or if you want to prep for nursing school better, um, our intro to biochem class that we're offering next, next winter is a pretty, yeah, pretty much all of the CSUs just want this class, which is why it's so, so full. Um, and our intro to biochem class is usually so empty because UNR is about the only nursing school nearby that actually wants more chemistry than this. Um, but if you do take the, if you're here next year and you take the intro to biochem course, I've heard from a lot of nursing students that it makes your pharmacology classes a lot easier um, because you understand things at a, at a much better level when it comes to the biochemistry. Uh, and that's really what pharmacology is, is understanding how drugs affect internal biochemistry. Um, so it would not be a bad idea if you're going to be here. It's a five unit class, but it's a very, it's a much more conceptual, less math driven five units than this class. Uh, and Carl Franz is teaching it next year and he's great and uh, has a very similar teaching style to me as well. Um, so if you've done well in this class and you wanna take more chemistry, I recommend that one or if you're considering going into more of a hard science major, become, um, if you're doing well in this class, there, then you're thinking, maybe I want to be go to pharmacy school, or maybe I want to go to medical school, or just get a bachelor's in biology, take Gen Chem. It's a whole year sequence, um, but it goes over a lot of the same concepts we do in this class, but at a, at a higher level. But we can also go slower, because we don't need to cover as much in one quarter. Um, and pretty much any engineering degree, any biology degree, any, any science degree is going to require you to take at least two quarters of general chemistry anyway. So if you think that if you're on the fence, you're nursing right now, but you're thinking maybe I want to study biology instead uh, or go into research or something like that, then def I highly recommend taking Gen Chem. Um, it's, it's a lot of units and a lot of time and effort but um, you'll get a lot out of it too. And if you can be, get good at chemistry, it will only help you as you go on to higher upper division classes. Um, so if you're here, have the time or considering other majors, highly recommend that. Um, and I find it to be a lot of fun as well, but I, I understand that my view is skewed on that one, so. And even I wouldn't have taken it just for fun when I was a college student. So I don't blame you. If you're just looking at eh, maybe I want to take one more chemistry class, you might not want to take the whole Gen Chem series because it is a lot of work, but it will also be helpful down the road. 
And then the other, most of the other questions I've seen are had to do with the quiz itself and some, some clarification. So we'll go over number four and number six, especially. Um, the main things I also wanted you guys to pay attention to, um, and I think most of the capitalization issues were um, just typos. When you're typing in a chemical chemical reaction, it's easy to let off shift one spot earlier than you meant to. Um, but I did see a few people write SIF4, um, which is technically incorrect. If it's for fluorine, you need to make sure that's a capital, uh, a capital F. And I didn't take off any points for that. Um, for this one, but I will on the test. So be paying attention for it. And that's not what I wanted to do. Um, and uh, make sure when you're putting your numbers in to write your units. I know that on the quizzes, it's sometimes it's uh, inconsistent um, as far as whether it'll let you write the units or not. But um, in general, try to at least write your units in. So again, I didn't take off points, but if you got 312.4 with no unit on behind that, on the test, I'm going to take off points for that. There should always be some context to tell me what you're talking about when it comes to a number, whether it's a percent sign or some or a unit. You got to have something there so I know what that number is. Um, so in this case, this was for the temperature conversion one. So it should have had Kelvin behind it. Uh, I just tried registering for Gen Chem, but one of the prereqs was a math course I haven't taken yet. Is that math course absolutely necessary to take for the course? It's, it's highly recommended and not just because of that, there's something magical about that course. If you had high school algebra, if you took algebra two in high school, then you have the math required. For Gen Chem, but it might not be showing up on your transcript. Um, so you, there's just a form you would need to fill out then. If you think if if you took Algebra two in high school, um, or and if you're following the algebra we're doing in this class without too much trouble, then you have the math skills necessary. You just have to fill out a prereq. I think it's called a prereq waiver form, and that one of the counselors can help me help you with that. Uh, and then it gets sent to me and I say, yes, you can take this class. It just isn't showing up in your transcript for some reason. Um, so by all means, if you're trying to register and having issues with that, talk to a counselor or email me about it and I can get, get you the right form and get you in touch with the right people um, to, to help out with that. All right, let me pull up the quiz and we'll talk about the quiz questions. Your last quiz. Which is a fun feeling for everyone, I think. All right, so most everybody got question one right. It's just a regular conversion, right? You just had to use temp, um, pressure units. So your conversion you would have been using would have been um, one, ATM equals 14.7 PSI. Um, what, and so you can um, calculate that just by using that. You're essentially going to be multiplying 200 times 14.7 PSI. So it's going to give you a number close to 3,000 PSI, which is a real number. That's that's actually what scuba tanks are generally filled up to. Um, and pretty much every the only thing that I think I marked anybody down for on this one was uh, sig figs. So remember that 200 ATM, 200.0 ATM is for sig figs, but 14.7 psi is only three. So your answer should have had three sig figs because we're using, we're not using an exact conversion, right? There is no exact conversion for atmospheres to PSI, at least that I'm aware of. <clears throat> um, body temperature, pretty much everybody 
um, was able to go Fahrenheit to Kelvin. Just watch your sig figs again um, because you are mixing your units with that, right? You're going to start by taking Fahrenheit and converting it to Celsius, which has both um, addition and it has multiplication in that conversion. So you have to be careful with that. Um, and I believe the final answer should have been plus or minus a tenth when you when you get your final conversion. So that would have taken it to the to the point point one place. Um, made this one multiple choice, but I also gave you a trick question in there. Or actually, no, that was the next one on question four. I did give you a bit of a trick question. Um, if you're talking about volume and pressure remember they're inversely proportional so if you cut the volume in half you're going to have to double the pressure right because you have the same number of gas molecules moving just as fast as they were but now there's less area for them to run into on the side of the wall so your pressure is going to go up by a corresponding amount if you cut your volume in half pressure doubles if you double your volume then your pressure gets cut in half. Um, question four, the main thing that I saw people miss on question four was that if you have a fixed volume and an initial pressure and then you're heating it from 25 Celsius to 125 Celsius, we can calculate the, the um, final pressure if we use the gas law that has both pressure and temperature in it, which looked like P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. Um, and you're just going to plug in your initial pressure of one atmosphere, your initial temperature, and your final temperature. The problem is and it's not really a problem, it's something I was trying to get you to pay attention to, is the units on your temperatures can't be in Celsius for this to work. They have to be in Kelvin. Yeah, so if you have two temps in Kelvin, and you're, and that's one of the reasons why I like the, um, the combined form for all of those gas laws, is it makes you think about what's being held constant and what's not. <clears throat> um, and that combined form that I'm talking about is that P1, V1 over N1, T1 equals P2, V2 over N2, T2. That has all the variables in it. But anything that's being held constant between before and after and in, in, at the beginning and at the end, anything that's a constant is the same number on both sides of the equation, which means it's gonna cancel itself out. So in this case, if it has a fixed volume, that means V1 is the same as V2. And if you've got the same number on both sides of the equation, you can just divide both sides by, by that volume and it disappears. So anything that is um, constant, you can basically just cancel it out. And the fact that it's a closed system tells you that moles is constant. And so once you cancel everything out, it's a constant, all you're left with is P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. Right. So if you don't have your slides in front of you, if you don't have that list of gas laws in front of you, all you really need is this version. And then the problem will tell you what to cancel out and what to leave in there. Anything constant gets canceled out. Right. And then if you put it in Kelvin, then you have, um, so T1 initially was 25 Celsius, which is going to make it 298. 0.2 Kelvin, T2 is going to be 398.2 Kelvin, and P1 is going to be your starting pressure, so one atmosphere. 
Right, so then you plug everything in, solve for P2, and you should get something. I'm trying to remember what the final answer was. So you might as well just, just do it. So one over 298.2 times 398.2. Uh, 1.34 atmospheres or 1.33 atmospheres within sig figs. Um, and we're limited in our sig figs based on that 1.00 ATM we started with. Right. So if you did this calculation and you got five atmospheres, that means you didn't put it in Kelvin. You went from 25, if you put 25 and 125 in and got five atmospheres, that just tells me that you didn't put it in Kelvin, right? So these equations only work if your temperature is in Kelvin or your temperature is constant. It says your temperature is held constant at 25 Celsius. That's fine. It's the same. It doesn't really matter if it's the same in Celsius or the same in Kelvin. You're still going to cancel it out when you look at this combined react law, right? At any time your temperature is changing, or if you're using PV equals NRT, has to be in Kelvin or it doesn't work. Hmm. All right. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, most of you got question five right without too much trouble. Remember, it's just a matter of reading what it's already telling you. I'm not asking you to fill out what the products are without knowing it. Um, and you didn't need to write the type of um, chemical reaction. I meant when I said type out, I meant like use your keyboard, um, not to give me the reaction type. Um, it is technically, well, I'll we'll talk about that in a second. So solid silicon dioxide, so SiO2 solid plus aqueous hydrofluoric acid, HF, AQ, goes to silicon tetrafluoride, so SiF4, as a gas, and liquid water. That's what I was looking for before it's balanced. And then we just have to go through and balance. Balancing this one's actually not so bad because you only have one source of fluorides, right? You're making silicon tetrafluoride. So you need four fluorides. If you don't have four, or on the left-hand side, we don't have four fluorides. So we change the coefficient to get four fluorides. And then all that's going to be left is oxygen and hydrogen. Our silicons are balanced. Our fluorides are balanced. We have four hydrogens on the left. We need four hydrogens on the right. And that also takes care of our oxygens. Right. So just more practice balancing and taking the nomenclature and turning it into the reaction. Um, and some up for whatever reason, a lot of you try to give me the type of chemical reaction as well. And this one's not entirely obvious what the type of chemical reaction is. But if you go through and you look at the oxidation state of everything before and after, nothing is changing oxidation state. Um, silicon is plus four on the reactant side, and it's plus four on the product side. Hydrogen is plus one on the, on the reactant side, and it's still plus one. Oxygen's negative two on both sides. Fluoride's negative one on both sides. So it's not a redox reaction. So out of our choice, it's definitely not a precipitation reaction either, because we're not mixing together two aqueous solutions and getting a solid product. So our best guess, if you were trying to figure out the type of reaction here, would be acid base. Um, it's a little bit hard to see where the H pluses are being transferred, but if you look at it as being two steps, it does do that. Your HF molecules give away an H plus to the oxygens to make the water. It just has, does it in two steps. You take the O2, 
or will you take those oxygens, convert them to an OH first, and then you add the second uh, hydrogen to turn it into uh, a water. So it's a little bit harder to see visually, which is why I was not asking you to do that for this problem, because it is a tricky one. Um, but at the very least, if you were stuck with this, if I decided to give you a really tricky one on the test, which I generally try not to do, but if I did, if I made a mistake and accidentally gave you a tricky one, you should just go to it and say, well, I, at least I know it's not a redox. I'm not sure it's an acid base or precipitation, but at least I can say it's complexation. It's definitely not redox. And that at least would give you most of the points um, if I decided to be a hard ass about it. Right? That's still where I would, the main distinction you're looking for is redox or not. Um, for question six, I gave you the reaction balanced, and it is, it kind of looks a bit like a precipitation reaction because you've got two aqueous solutions and you make a solid product, but you actually do have the oxidation state of the iodide is changing. It's going from negative one to zero. So it's a redox reaction, actually, in this case. And the charge of the copper actually is changing as well. Copper is going from plus two to plus one. So if you, unless you very clearly can look at it and recognize, oh, absolutely nothing is changing charge and I make a solid product, um, you probably want to double check that you're getting the same charges, ox same oxidation states for everything on both sides, just to make sure it's not a redox reaction, because this one is a tricky one that way. Um, if we want to know how many grams of iodine are produced from this situation, well, the fact that it tells us we have excess, that's good news because that means we don't need to mess around with the limiting reactant. If it tells you you have excess, excess of one of your reactants, that's just straight up telling you that's not your limiting reactant. Your limiting reactant is the other reactant. So. If we were going to do this calculation, we'd say, okay, well, first thing I'm going to do then, if I have excess potassium iodide, I know that's my limiting reactant. So I'm going to figure out how many moles I have. And if you have a solution and a concentration, then you're going to be using that concentration to get to moles. So 425 milliliters at a certain concentration. Well, remember that mo capital M means moles per liter. So we're going to start with 425 milliliters. And we're going to convert that, <laughs> excuse me, to liters. And once we have liters, we can use that concentration to say, okay, well, for every one liter of solution, that's 1.75 moles. So we'll get, zero point seven four four moles, of copper to chloride. And now we're at the stoichiometry step where we're trying to take moles of reactant and figure out how many moles of product. We're just going to use the balanced reaction. So we can say 0 0.744 moles of copper to chloride. And our stoichiometry is two moles of copper two chloride makes one mole of iodide. I uh, sorry, iodine. So two moles CuCl2, one mole of I2. So we're going to just cut that number in half 7.744 over two.
we're going to get a number of zero point three seven two moles of iodine. So then just go back and double check your problem statement. We're looking for grams of iodine. So if we want grams of iodine, you just use the molecular weight. And one mole of I2, you check the periodic table. The molecular weight of iodine is 126.9, and there are two of them. So 126.9 times two is 253.8. So final answer, 94.4 moles by two. And so again, I know that on these on these longer stoichiometry problems, there's a lot of places to mess up. Um, and one of the things that's that's tricky initially is molecular weight for iodine, because iodine in its pure form is diatomic, right? So why do I need to put why do I need to double the atomic mass from the periodic table? Well, because the atomic mass is per is the weight per mole of atoms, not the weight per mole of molecules. So if each atom is 126 or yeah, 126.9, then a molecule of I2 is going to have a mass that's twice that. Sorry, thank you, grams of I2. And one more place where it's easy to mess up, right? Do all the math right and then write your units wrong at the end. And I still have to mark you down for it, even if it's a, a slap on the wrist deduction. Um, but that's why it's almost impossible to get a perfect score on these chemistry tests, right? So anything, I mean, I've, so I was a lazy student. I think I've, I've told you guys that before. Um, I thought anything above a 90% on a test was exactly where I should be because if I got more than a 90% on the test, that meant that I, I studied too hard. I spent too much time studying for it. All I really wanted was that 90%. Um, but I understand that some people really like to, you know, try and be perfect on every problem. That's really hard in chemistry. So don't beat yourself up. If you get anything above a 95, you did really well on this test. Right? So don't get too hung up on, on getting perfect numbers. Uh, you had 259.82 for the weight of I2. Um, it could just be a different periodic table. I'm using the periodic table that I have sit on my as my desktop background, which says um, the atomic mass is 126.9, um, 90447. So then, yeah, if you got 129.9, that's just probably a result of the periodic table, table that you're using. Uh, and see, yeah, probably just a, a, a typo on the periodic table you're using because Wikipedia also says 126. Um, and, you know, Wikipedia is not the definitive um, answer here, but. If it matches mine, the one that I'm looking at, it's probably right. So wait, key table, the more, slightly more definitive version, uh, iodine 126.90. So no big deal. If you got the wrong atomic mass um, for, for iodine, no big deal. It says um, it's, you know, I would consider that in this case to be within sig figs anyway. So it should not have got resulted in a deduction anyway. So just your number looking a little bit different. Can I ask you something? Absolutely. Okay. So I understand like changing the milliliters to liters and like 
changing the grams to the moles. I just don't understand like when you say like two parts of the, re the reaction react with the one part of iodide. Like, I don't know when I'm supposed to do that part of the conversion. I don't know if um, I'm explaining it right, but. Yeah, no, I, I think I hear what you're saying. So if, if I'm hearing what you're what you're asking correctly, you, it's the, the stoichiometry step, the going from moles of one thing to moles of another thing that's confusing for you, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And so the the key to know when you're doing that is is if you're trying to go for if you're talking about the same compound for your entire problem, then you never need to use that step because you're you know if I say how many grams of sodium chloride you need to dissolve in in a one liter of water to make this molarity, you're talking about sodium chloride the whole way through. But the second I say how much of one compound does it take to make a certain amount of a different compound? As soon as we want to talk about changing from one compound to another, that's when you need to use the stoichiometry step. That's when you're going to use those conversions where you're talking about where you use the, um, the coefficients, right? And so does that, does that kind of clear it up a little bit? Yeah, well, thank you. Okay. Um, and that, that's really the only way to do that. The only, unless you have some other conversion that's given in a word problem that says you make one kilogram of CO2 every time you burn a, ga a gallon of gas. Like that's kind of a, that's a conversion that's it has to be given to you. But if it's something like going from a balanced chemical reaction from one reactant to something else, you're always going to need to use those coefficients and you're always going to need to get to moles because that's how you do those conversions. I have a question as well. Yeah. Um, is this asking us the theor like the actual yield or does this have nothing to do with that? Um, so technically, this is iodine. Yeah. So I guess I to make it more clear, I could have written it as what is the theoretical yield of iodine? Because you don't have enough tools to be able to get to the actual yield. The actual yield pretty much always has to either be given to you or you would have to measure it directly. You don't. We don't have a tool for predicting actual yield. Anything okay. where where we start from moles of reactant and you're trying to get to um, an amount of product is always a theoretical yield. So you just treat it like that problem. And a theoretical yield can always be found if you have the information for the um, limited reactant. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. No problem. Any other quiz questions at this point? All right, well then, now is as good a time as any, better than most, to take a break. Um, so let's take a 10 minute break and come back at 2.35 and we will get into practicing with PV equals NRT.
All right, let's bring it on back. Um, so this was about where we left off last week. Um, we got to that combined gas law equation. Um, and again, this really has all of the other simple gas laws embedded in it. So you don't need to remember Boyle's law versus Charles law versus Gay-Lussac's law versus the combined law. They're all right here. All you have to do is whatever is being held constant, you cross it off of both sides because you have this, if you have the same temperature on both sides, it cancels out. If you have the same volume on both sides, it cancels out. And what you're left with is the appropriate simple gas law for whatever is changing. And so in this case, based on if we said constant temperature, constant volume, then we can say P1 over N1 equals P2 over N2. So in this case, this is something where, you, where you've got a fixed volume for some reason, but there's some sort of chemical reaction that's happening that's causing an increase in the moles of gas. So it could be something like um, mixing vinegar and baking soda in a two liter bottle and then putting the lid on it and assuming it's staying at the same temperature, you've got a fixed volume of two liters. And if your temperature is not changing, um, then all that's changing is your moles of gas is going up as you make CO2. And therefore, your pressure is going up. And you can calculate how much according to this. Um, anything, any, and, and a lot of gas evolution reactions wind up being really useful for this reason. Um, For instance, um, it's not constant pressure, it's constant, it's, or sorry, it's not changing pressure, it's changing volume, but uh, airbags in a car. Um, when airbags go off, it goes through a chemical reaction that generates a large number of gas molecules really, really quickly from a solid product or a solid reactant. And all that happens is you take your gas, your airbag, and it starts really, really small. And then you generate a whole bunch of gas molecules really quickly. And so your volume expands very quickly because you're keeping constant pressure and constant temperature. So there are lots of different types of situations where you'd want to use one version of this. And if you can remember this version or this is what's on your equation sheet, then you have the rest of them. Um, and that means all you really need to remember is PV equals NRT. How did I do that? If you know PV equals NRT, you can always rearrange it to look like this. And that tells you PV are on top, N and T are on bottom. Right, so as long as you can remember this, that's all the gas laws you need. So let's practice using that. If we have a scuba tank and it has a volume of 15 liters and it's filled to a pressure of 200 atmospheres at 22.5 Celsius, how many moles of gas are in the tank? So give this a second and then we'll work through it.
All right, let's start working through this. So, um, the variables, the relevant variables are called out pretty explicitly here, but if they weren't explicitly called out as this is the pressure and this is the volume, you might need to look at the units to determine what the numbers are. A lot of times you'll see, see things written as a closed system of gas is held at two atmospheres and 45 Celsius. It doesn't say specifically that the two atmospheres is the pressure, but if you watch your units, that tells you it's the pressure. Um, so in this case, temperature is 22.5 Celsius, which means it's 295.7 Kelvin. Remember, Kelvin is Celsius plus 273.2, as it's written over on the side. Pressure is mixed up my color coding. Volume is 15.0 liters. Pressure is 200 atm. So it's just a matter of solving for n with this equation here. And remember that so r is is um oh, it's tempting to not put in the work to actually write out the units for r to just use 0 0.08206. But that makes it really easy if I do something kind of kind of tricky like give you the volume in gallons instead of liters it's easy to forget that you needed to convert that to liters. So I highly recommend writing all your units for R, um, even if it's not on something you're turning in, just to make sure that you are get everything in the right units. And that is your number one reminder that you have to put your temperature in Kelvin. Right, that's the, the most obvious place that you're going to see that. So if we were trying to um, write out our answer here, we've got pressure, pressure times volume. NRT. So for pressure, plug in your 200 atmospheres. And you can do the algebra first to solve for N before you plug everything in, or you can do it after. It doesn't really make a difference. If we were doing the algebra first, we would could rearrange this. We would divide both sides by R and T. And so we would get moles equals pressure times volume over R times temperature. Um, but it's not particularly important that you, whether you do the algebra before or after. Once we plug everything in, and R again, if you're in the right units, R is always the same number. Liters, atmospheres, or moles times Kelvin. So getting a number, and get 123.6. And actually, with sig figs, we're only keeping three sig figs because of the volume. 
124 moles. If we're watching our units, atmospheres canceled atmospheres, liters canceled liters, Kelvin canceled Kelvin. We're left in one over one over moles, which just simplifies to moles. And that seems like a big number, right? But if you want to do a reasonableness check, these are very broadly ballpark close to the same number, right? 300 versus 200. Um, but it's not going to be a huge swing as far as an order of magnitude. Then you've got 15 divided by 0.1. When you divide by 0.1, that's the same as multiplying by 10. So 15 times 10 would be 150. So really, really broadly, really um, roughly, 124 and 150 are close to the same answer. So that tells us that, that we plugged it in right. If you get a number that seems too big or too small, but everything that you plugged in is right, then the only question is really, did I put it in my calculator right? And so that's doing being able to do really rough, roughly in your head, check your answer, at least did I get in the right ballpark, um, is a pretty useful skill for double checking yourself on these. And you can do it really as, as roughly as I just did it. Call 200 and 300 the same. Call 0 0.08 a tenth. Just for the sake of, of getting close within a factor of 10 of the right answer. Um, quickly in your head. So it's not a bad habit to be in. Um, it's just what, what they call a reasonableness check. And that actually shows up all over the place. Um, in every field, there's a reasonableness check. Um, if you're going to the healthcare field, you always wanna do a reasonableness check on something like a prescription or medication for a patient, right? Because missing, dropping a decimal somewhere um, would, would potentially make, your, make it so the medicine does nothing or you could kill someone um, if you gave them 10 times the dose of morphine that you were supposed to because you didn't double check the body weight and you put in the body weight was, um, was 1,500 pounds instead of 150 pounds, right? So, and even stuff like payroll, payroll still has to do a reasonableness check. If you accidentally cut somebody a check for $30,000 a month instead of $3,000 a month, your supervisors are gonna be a little upset with you. Um, so, having that ballpark idea of whether or not your calculation is correct is really important. Oddly enough, things like that happen. People will get checks for 10 times their regular salary. And instead of asking questions about it, payroll it, um, just wrote the check without thinking about it critically. And the person who gets the check just cashes it instead of saying, this must be a mistake. Um, that happens from time to time. So, and it's always a huge headache to deal with something like that. <clears throat> um, this is a this is a sort of a shorthand way of doing PV equals NRT to get to moles. Um, and so it's what's referred to as molar density. And molar density is basically saying how what volume do I need to get a one mole? Um, and so the way we can do that is if we say, okay, well, let's just pick a standard temperature and pressure that's close to regular conditions. And we're gonna say, okay, let's just for the sake of making our calculations easy. We're just going to assume we're at, at STP. Um, and STP was chosen because one atmosphere is the standard pressure at sea level, and 90% of the, the world's population lives close to sea level. And zero Celsius was chosen as standard temperature um, because um, that's the average worldwide temperature over the over the course of the entire year. At least it used to be when they first defined this. Now it's about one and a half to two degrees Celsius higher than that. Um, 
but if you average the temperature for the entire planet for the entire year, you get about zero Celsius. Um, so if we say, okay, let's just say these are my standard conditions. How many liters do I need to get in order to have one mole of gas? So in this case, you, you have, once again, you're given three pieces out of the four. You're given everything but volume. Um, and so if you start from PV equals NRT and solve for volume by plugging in one mole of gas, zero Celsius, except then put it in Kelvin, and plug in one atmosphere for your pressure, we can get a number for volume. And so what we would actually wind up solving for, we'd say volume equals NRT divided by the pressure. Pressure is one ATM. Temperature is 273.15 Kelvin. And let's call one atmosphere exact for the sake of this definition uh, and one mole exact. Uh, N equals one mole. If we solve, or if we plug all those numbers in and solve for volume, we can get a number. It says at standard temperature and pressure, one mole of gas at STP equals 22.414 liters. So if you're at standard temperature and pressure, every 22 liters of gas is one mole gas, which as long as you're at standard temperature and pressure, that's actually really, really convenient to be able to use a conversion factor in order to go from um, moles to liters of a gas. Um, so at STP winds up being a very helpful thing. And it also gives you, again, a good ballpark understanding. Even if we're not at exactly one atmosphere in zero Celsius, you can still say things like, I know about 20 liters of gas, of gas is one mole. And so again, that gives you a reasonableness check. Um, even if you're not exactly at standard temperature and pressure. Will that number, um, the 22.414, always be the number for volume in this equation? As long as you're at STP. Okay. If you're at standard temperature and pressure, then yes, that's a really convenient number to have. As soon as you're not at STP, you can't do that, and you actually have to plug in your new pressures and temperatures to solve for volume or to solve for moles. Um, but it does allow us to do things like, say, say um, you have one, um, you have 22 liters of propane at STP, how many grams of CO2 is that going to produce if, um, when it burns? It gives you a good shorthand, kind of like a concentration. It's a really convenient way to, to describe a stoichiometry problem. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Like this. So here's our, our classic um, vinegar and baking soda problem. If you have 10, if you have excess vinegar and 10 grams of baking soda, how many liters of CO2 can we make at STP? Well, we want to double check that everything's balanced, but I know this reaction and I, I know it is. Um, one acetate on the left, you've still got acetate on the right. One sodium on the left, one sodium on the right. Um, the hydrogen carbonate plus the extra hydrogen from the acetic acid turns into water and CO2 in a one-to-one -one ratio. So all of our stoichiometry is just one-to-one -one for this reaction. 
if we want to know how many liters of CO2 will be collected at standard temperature and pressure, we can plug in 10 grams and get it into moles for the sodium hydrogen carbonate. So Ten point zero grams NaHCO three. Sodium is twenty two point nine nine seven or something like that, right? Twenty two point nine eight nine eight. So twenty two point nine nine. Um, that so that's just sodium. And add all the rest of it. 2.98 plus hydrogen plus 3 oxygens plus a carbon get a a molecular weight of 84 point 006 is one mole of NaHCO3. So that gives us 0 0.119. Moles. So nothing tricky so far, just like any of the stoichiometry steps. And again, your clue that it's going to be stoichiometry is the fact that it's saying how many liters of CO2 and you're starting in an amount of a different compound. That tells you you have to do some um, converting of one compound to another. So if we want to say point, 0. Point, One one nine moles of NaHCO three and one mole NaHCO three is one mole of CO two made. So that gets us to a number for moles of, of product. But we don't usually, when, we, when it comes to gases as a product, we don't usually measure gases, uh, theoretical yield of gases in grams or in um, you know, a solution or something like that. If it's a gas, you, it's way more common to measure the amount of product you make by collecting it, and measuring the volume, or or measuring the pressure of a container before and after, and then using gas laws. So the last step here is that we want to. If we're at STP, we could either just take the 0.119 and we can plug it into PV equals NRT if we wanted to and solve for volume. Because we know if it's at STP, that means we know that temperature equals 273.15. We know that pressure equals 1.000 ATM. And in this case, we know now that moles is 0 0.119 moles. And R is always the same, right? I'm not going to write it out. Let me give myself enough room. 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres mole kelvin again that's on your 
on your equation sheet. You know all the pieces here except for volume. So you could solve for volume. Or you can take advantage of the fact that your equation sheet also has the number of liters per mole at STP on it. And then you can say 0 0.119 moles CO2 and every one mole of CO2, one mole of any gas at STP is 22.414 liters. So instead of having to use PV equals NRT, if you're at standard temperature and pressure, you can just use it as another conversion. It's just a quick way to easily get to volume here. We get 0.119 times 22.414, 2.67 liters of gas. So that actually makes it really obvious why it's why this is a convenient reaction if you want to demonstrate a volcano, right? Start with 10 grams of, of sodium of uh, baking soda is, you know, a quarter of a cup, not even probably. You add that to, and it makes two liters of gas. So oh, almost three liters. So picture a two liter bottle of gas. And it does it in the form of bubbles, you know, as a as foam. So that's why it's convenient for for showing that. And if you're looking for fun things to do with kids or play around with kitchen chemistry, um, before you add the baking soda, add some dish soap to your vinegar and mix it all up. And then those those uh, foamy bubbles stick around a lot longer. Um, otherwise, they dissipate pretty quickly. You wind up making quite a mess. So I'd recommend doing it outside as well. Um, and there's nothing wrong with instead of using this conversion, this conversion is a, is a time saver. But if you have all of the pieces, you can just go to using PV equals NRT to answer this question. Or if you're not at standard temperature and pressure, you have to use PV equals NRT. Yeah, the, exactly. The volcano for the kids is very fun for that. And actually, if you want to demonstrate how Mount St. Helens blew the cap off of it, you could actually dump it in there and then shove a cork in the top really fast and then step back. Um, don't shove it in too tight because you don't want the volcano tube to blow up. Um, but uh, it's a pretty effective way of showing what happens when pressure builds up in a closed system. Right. And so the way that that I will frequently, at frequently, I pretty much always ask the question the same way on the on the exam. And let me get the practice exam, pull it up so you can look at it. Mm. The way I do this on the exam is do something like make, make this ideal gas law part of a stoichiometry problem. Figure out how many moles of gas you're going to make and then give you all the other pieces so that you can figure out the pressure. Or I'll say something just like this problem did. How many liters can it make at STP? Right, so it's, I don't give you a se separate problem for these gas laws. I typically will give you um, the gas laws in the form of a stoichiometry problem. Right, so you're going to need to basically figure out moles, get the rest of your information put together, and plug it into PV equals NRT to get to whatever variable I'm asking you for. Right, so. And I'll reiterate this as well. So each one of these 
sections on the test is 10 points. And it's a lot of pages, but that's just because that since um, we're not, I'm not printing out this test for you. Um, I want to make sure I gave you enough problem or enough space for each of these. You don't need to use all of these spaces. Um, but each one of these sections, part one, part two, part three, et cetera, is worth 10% of your grade on the test. And so the first half is mostly conceptual stuff. Practice using, you know, show me how you know how to do rounding properly. Show me how you know how to do basic conversions. Show me you know how to do Vesper geometries. But seven, eight, and nine, so at least 30% of your overall grade on this on the timed test is stoichiometry based. So there's gonna be an easy one where it's balance the reaction, I give it to you in moles, you tell me the theoretical yield in moles. Then I make it a little harder, balance the reaction and do a gas loss and figure out how many moles you have and then do a gas loss. Or balance the reaction and then tell me how many, what the pH is at the end, like we've been practicing, right? But all three of those are stoichiometry at their heart. They're just different flavors of stoichiometry. And then there's always the last part of it is that what is going to be a wild card question where I do something like um, where I make you do a, some sort of word problem and make you think on your feet a little bit. Um, and those are what I'm really looking for is that you can at least get me a plan how you would get to what's given from what's given to the answering the question. Um, if you don't actually have time to do that or you get hung up on the specifics of, of actually doing the calculation, if you at least have an idea of where to start, I can give you partial credit for it. And again, this is mostly to separate A's, A's from B's on the test, not A's from B's in the overall class. Right, so you can get a 90% or close to a 90% on the, on the test without even touching that last problem. Right, because I'm telling you exactly what each one of these other sections is going to be. Right, so, um, and then the other piece of this that I added last year, since we're doing this all distance, um, and I do want you to at least try some of the word problems is that I'm also adding a take home section, meaning that you have all week to work on it. It's gonna be stuff like, like the um, word problems from the homeworks where, um, and it's just two problems. You have a whole week to work on them and submit it. Um, and they're, they're each worth 10 points each as well. It goes into the same category as this test, right? So if word problems are not your favorite, um, but given enough time, hopefully you can at least answer some stoichiometry based word problems like the homeworks, since we've been working on those for a long time. Um, that's going to be 20% and there's no time pressure on that. You have a whole week to do those. The only one, the only word problem that has time pressure is number 10 on the, on the exam. Right. And that's just to, because I want to test to see if you can think on your feet at least a little bit give me the idea where to start, okay? And if I'm being totally honest, um, I have a lot of students not even write anything for number 10. If you get one through nine nailed and you did your take-home problems and you're pretty confident on those, you can get an A on the, in, the, in the exam category without even writing anything for number 10, right? So it's designed so that the time pressure shouldn't hurt you too much if you're if you've got test anxiety or anything like that and if you do have accommodations also i'll remind you also right now um make sure you email me this week and i'll make sure that you get the appropriate amount of time on your um on your exam most for most of you the exam should take about two hours and you'll have to be hustling to get it all done in that amount of time, but that's kind of the idea. You still have to practice and, and be ready for it. Um, and then, but then the take home problems, you get a whole week. 
Okay, so um, just since we're getting into getting close to finals week, and I know I'm getting lots of questions about the structure of the test, I believe the practice exam is available now as well. So once you finish your last homework assignment from last week, take a look, or before, if you um, take a look at the practice exam, do some of the problems. Um, good question. So you will be submitting the um, final exam. It's going to actually be set up just like one of our quizzes. So you're going to, it's going to, it's broken up into pieces. Um, so it's look, going to look like 10 questions and you're going to have a different PDF for each of those questions. And then you're going to upload your own answer. You know, I, just like we've been doing for, for all of our quizzes and the homeworks. Um, for each of those and you're so you're supposed to take two hours and then I'm, I added an extra 15 minutes on there for technology issues. So to make sure that your stuff gets uploaded. Um, you do not need continuous Internet contact. Um, internet connection in order to do this once you once you hit start it gives you your your 10 PDFs. Um, and then you have two two hours plus 15 minutes to submit your PDF photos of your answers. All right, so hopefully it should be fairly similar to what we've done in the past. The only difference compared to our quizzes is that it has a time limit associated with it too. So we have to photocopy them and do it on the cam scanner? Um, so I would recommend cam scanner, but, or you could use, you know, you could take a picture, um, and just, and you can take a picture with your webcam and, um, and put it into a word doc if you want. However, you've been doing your home, submitting your homeworks will work for this as well. All right. So if you've been doing your homeworks by, by, you know, typing it all out in word, for instance, you could do that or copy and pasting pictures of your work into word. However, it's been working for you. We're going to keep doing that. Um, and again, there is a time limit on it. And if you get locked out or, um, you know, if you take two hours and 16 minutes, it won't let you submit your, your answers. Um, but I don't want to give you a zero because you took one extra minute. So what you do in that case is just as soon as you can, email it to me. The timestamp on your PDFs and the timestamp on the email that you send to me tells me that you are only two minutes over. And uh, as long as you're not more than five minutes late or 10 minutes late, or um, then I'm not going to take off any points for that. I want you to get it submitted in that two hours and 15 minutes. That's the whole idea. Um, but I'm not going to be too strict about taking off points if it's late. There is a, a limit to that. And if everybody submits it via email because nobody got it done on time. I'm going to be in a bad mood and I'm going to probably be a little harsher on when it comes to, um, you know, being late on those. So do your best to get them submitted in the two hours and 15 minutes that you have. But if it goes a little bit later than that, just email it to me as soon as you can. Or if you lose your internet connection, um, then just get it to me by email as fast as you can. Um, and if it's a long period of internet outage or something like that, um, make sure you save your PDF file or your Word document because it stores all that information about when it was created and saved. So get it saved as soon as you can and then get it sent to me as soon as you can. And I can tell if you did it on time or not. So if you took four hours and then you try to send me your PDF and say, oh, I just didn't submit it on time because my internet went out. And then I look at the timestamp on the PDF and it says that, it, that you took four hours to finish it. Um, then I'm going to mark you down for that as though you took all of that time. So get your file saved as soon as you can, even if you can't send it to me right away. Would um, you recommend then like sending the PDFs as you finish them or just do it all at once? I believe that, that that's how the quiz is. You can actually do that. You can upload part one when you finish part one, upload part two when you finish part two, et cetera. And if you go back and want to want to double check your answers and re-upload it at the end, you can. Um, but uh, yeah, it wouldn't be a bad idea because then at most you've got one one of your 10 sections is not uploaded. 
as opposed to missing all of them. Um, so yeah, not a bad idea to, to go about it that way. All right, got a little bit sidetracked. Um, on talking about the test, but that's okay because we got through everything that I wanted to get through today. So the rest of this is mainly more practice using gas laws to do stoichiometry. And we can go through these problems. And this is just a duplicate slide, um, as is that one. Um, so we, we can go through the rest of these practice problems in the review session on Wednesday, as well as any other types of problems you want practice with. The practice problems from the practice test or just anything else, you guys are in the driver's seat on Wednesday. So uh, have an idea of what you want more practice with, and we'll do it for two hours. Um, plus, wow, you guys don't have a new lab this week, right? So. Um, if you want to go into the lab time today or on Wednesday to do more practice with it or get more questions answered about what happens with technology issues or stuff like that, um, come to lab, ask questions. All right. Does everybody have a pretty, feeling pretty confident they know what's going on for the next week? Um, in, in this class, you'll be ready to take a final once you practice the practice test and everything. Okay. If you're not, again, just keep asking questions. I'm going to stop recording for now. Um, if any relevant questions get asked during lab, I'll record those and upload those later. Um, but I think for now, we're in pretty good shape. So we'll call lecture three minutes early for once. Um, and then uh, I'll open up the lab Zoom at 3.30 uh, at like usual. Hey, Sean, I'm sorry, I do have a question. Um, yeah. Just to summarize what you just said there, I can turn in my exam with CAMSAM scanner. Absolutely. In fact, okay. that's the way I would recommend doing it. Okay, thanks. Um, and actually, along with that, you do not have to print out the PDFs of your problems. You can just do them on binder paper and submit it that way. Just keep it organized and in the right order um, so that I because there's, it's really, really hard for me to grade everything when you do parts one through five of number two on one page and then buried in the middle of number six, I find part six of number two. Um, so like, just try to keep yourself organized, but I have no problem with you just using scratch paper or binder paper to, to do that and just doing that. So that's no big deal if you don't have a, a printer. Cool, all right, I'm gonna stop recording then. and. Uh, I'll see you in lab or on review session on Wednesday.